Okay, so for this last one, uh, having it's more of a, uh, it's more of an extension of what we learned for this last topic is focusing about evolution. And basically, these are some of the objectives that we will, uh, all the objectives that we will cover for today. I won't go into very deep details. This is all just very uh, surface understanding for you to at least uh, when the next time when you actually do look at evolutionary tree, you will be able to interpret better as to what goes on behind the evolution. So first and foremost, in terms of what is evolution, evolution is a gradual change in species over time. It refers to the process that has transformed or changed life on earth from the earliest form, which is the ancestor, to the vast diversity that we observe today, which is the descendants that we can see right now. Any change in heritable traits, so heritable traits are your characters, uh, your morphological characters, or it can be molecular characters, that is inherited, that it can be passed down from the parent to the offsprings within a population across generation. Evolutionary change is based mainly on the interactions between populations of an organism and their environment. So this is what we talk about the relationships, okay? So normal phylogeny, just phylogeny, it does look at the relationship of species. Evolution takes into account the timing. Okay, so although this is pretty much a diagram, if this, if this phylogeny did actually have a scale, this branches that you see here would actually mean something. The length of the branch means how the species has evolved over time. So sometimes if you see a short branch, um, it's mainly because that probably the species died off and at the at the period and that's why you don't see any more of the species. Uh, so and etc. Like in this case for the cathecines, um, it has evolved to what we are able to see now, including the hypo, uh, hippopotamus. So we can see all this descendants right now. Most of these others actually have died off over time. So the branches actually shows time. Okay. And, um, okay, so what are the types of theories that come with explaining diversity as we know of now? So the first theory that was presented is the theory of special creation. So Carlos Nereus, 1775, his theory for diversity, uh, creation is all living things came into existence in their present form especially and specifically created by nature. So if you notice, um, when Carlos Linnaeus, when he, um, when he, um, uh, what do you call this? When he, ex when he proposed this whole idea of taxonomy and how the, the concept and its application, it's still very much usable. But in terms of how he understood as to why species are where we are now, in terms of creation, is something that a lot of traditionalists believe. So traditionalists in terms of, mainly this is actually what religion also holds on to. So like, if you look in, uh, if you look at the Bible and probably even the book of Islam, uh, for, for the Quran, we actually look into creation so uh, the book is where genesis like for christians we have the book of genesis and so probably carlos Linnaeus also formed his theory based on creation so meaning to say that whatever animals whatever plants whatever organisms that you see right now it was already present in its form it was never evolved okay so this is what carlos Linnaeus believed to be so that's why and it would make sense in terms of if taxonomy only applies to what you see in terms of morphology and you and you group those characters based into these different groups, then yes, taxonomy is definitely still applies. 
okay but which is why if you notice taxonomy looks at characters looks at your character states but it does not show evolutionary relationship because in the theory for creation uh carlos linnaeus believes it and again a lot of traditionists believe that species were formed as it is it was never evolved to begin with okay so this is what his theory perceives it to be but then you come about with the the, the later scientists like aristotle lamarck and the more popular known darwin who proposed the theory of natural selection so um in contrast to creation they believe uh, they propose that organisms might evolve over time with which one type of organism gives rise to another type of organisms and they evolve over time so if this is basically a timeline of all some of the famous scholars that have that we are familiar with and what are the kinds of theories that they propose over time so with carlos linnaeus you have taxonomy which is very much still applied now but in terms of his creation is a very much debatable thing because you have people who have different opposing ideas and then you have different people like hutton lamarck and all who came about with different uh, with other theories such as gradualism uh, evolution populations etc um okay so what we want to focus on is some uh, just some of the key points not all of them the rest you can if you're more interested you can do your own reading but i'm going to be focusing on on certain concepts that are more related with uh, how evolution came to be about so with lamarck's theory of evolution what he proposes is in terms of uh, the, the rules that comes about this is organisms constantly strive to improve themselves by changing okay changes are adaptations to the environment acquired in an organism's lifetime so this one is very very much linked to natural selection also because natural selection also looks at adaptation so what forces animals or plants or any organisms to change over time it still falls within the environment okay and then a structure is so from that adaptation say example like once upon a time um climate was such that it was ice age so obviously the environment was way cooler at the time so because of the environmental pressures of the time so certain certain animals a structure is modified and we change to use in the environment for it to survive so some of the modification will be inherited towards the offspring but not all modifications can be brought to offspring some will be just considered variations okay so there's a different between variations and those uh which also can be had inherited but not necessarily adaptations that will come over time so there's a difference here and then inheritance of acquired characteristics okay so inheritance we need to say that what basically in short to summarize all this an environment is the one that stresses or gives pressure for animals to change and thrive over time some of these changes um the animals can adapt well some cannot may not be able to adapt well but uh they are able to transfer that particular character over time to their offspring so examples for lemmerx theory of evolution is very much applied say for in this case for giraffes at one point uh some of the ancestors actually had a short neck but then because of environmental um conditions in this case the giraffe actually had to thrive on a particular species of plant which is actually way further up so in order to not compete with resources with other species eventually the species gradually actually had longer necks compared to shorter necks so the shorter neck ones will probably have died off and then the longer necks one will be able to to thrive better and that character is passed on to its offspring and passed on until we do see a current descendant of giraffes where they have long necks so that is how lemmerx theory of evolution is applied and can be seen uh and it's very lemmerx theory uh, is actually very much similar also to darwin's theory of evolution 
but Darwin's theory, obviously, um, his his observations of evolutions were evo uh, sorry of uh, were derived from his observation at the Galapagos. So I really do hope you guys know where the Galapagos is. If you do not know, please do your check because as marine scientists, marine biology, and even those in the fisheries department, all to say you don't know where the Galapagos Islands is is quite embarrassing, lah. So please do your check. But just so you know, um, it's off the coast of North and South America, uh, North and South America on the on the what do you call this? The west side of the continent. So Darwin's theory of evolution, he saw this change, uh, you know, seeing changes, but he saw differences of uh, these turtles or tortoises, sorry, actually based on their necks. And these guys were actually found on different islands. Okay, so all of the Galapagos is actually in very close proximity. But because each of these islands had different kinds of food resources, so their necks are actually quite different based also on the resources that were found on that island. So like for Isabella Island, you will see a lot of these, which has just the dome-shaped shell. Whereas these, you'll find more of the saddleback shell. And for this, you'll see more of the intermediate shell. So perhaps there was an evolution of how these, the, uh, the dome shape actually formed into intermediate and then later the saddleback. Based on the neck, you will see that some of the species probably had to reach out for higher plants so that it can reach out. So this is evolution that you can see, um, that you can see based on the descendants of the different islands. Um, also on the Galapagos Islands, Darwin actually found finches, which is uh, a type of bird which is actually quite famous for this particular kind of beak. But from this beak, they actually have, again, also evolved based on the kinds of foods uh, and which actually help um, adapt to this kind of feeding adaptation. Okay. So the habitat and the food that are found in the environment is what drives it to change its feeding adaptation and its lifestyle. So for example, the vegetarian tree finch obviously feeds off fruits from the trees and that's why it has a parrot-like beak. But for example, say the woodpecker finch, it is more longer and sharper and narrower because it feeds off insects from trees and that's why... Um, what do you call it? It may also even use cactus spines. So the, all these are different. Uh, even for this, but the large ground finch. So it feeds off seeds from the ground. So the fact that it needs to feed off seeds, so obviously it needs a broader, stronger, more durable beak in order to break um, the seeds that they feed off. So that is, um, again, natural selection that helps evolve species over time. So natural selection and evolution actually go hand in hand. So without environmental change uh, or pressures, you won't be able to have these uh, characters that will be passed on to gen uh, from different species. But for the theory of creation, uh, their concept is these species are already formed as it is. There was no link, there was no adaptation based on the environment. So that is what makes creation different from evolution. So Darwin's theory of evolution, it's common descendant with modification. So it's not very different from Lemrecht's theory. It's more, he, has, he um, polished up or just added on more to his theory, where he's including a descendant with modification. So if you notice, this one um, doesn't very much emphasize a lot on descendants and um, ancestors. This one talks about more of how environment changes over time, all right? Changes species over time. So in this case, it's about having to see a relations to descendant for some unknown ancestor that lived in a distant past. So based on the characters, Darwin wants to find out what characters are considered primitive and what characters are considered uh, more derived. So as you guys would already know based on the class just now, 
you will have to assess on those character states based on how many of those primitive characters that are shared among groups and which character that are very exclusive to certain groups. So from there, you can see which one is more derived and which one is more primitive. So for further information, please check out on this YouTube um, to, to, for further understanding. So natural selection and adaptation is where population of individual species become better adapted to the environment through natural selection, just like the one, the picture of the giraffe. So what natural selection looks like at are these different factors. So first, basically what drives natural selection is the struggle for existence. So members of each species have to compete for all this food, shelter, and other life necessities to reproduce in a very specific environment. So it's survival of the fittest lab, basically. All right, that's what natural selection pushes us all to do. So some, if you cannot adapt to that certain change over time, it becomes as a shock. So some will die. And then, uh, like say global warming, very easy example. So certain species are very much able to adapt, and especially like say with corals. Certain corals are able to, ex to, to survive well with different thresholds of temperatures but some are very sensitive and then they might die off or they may go extinct. So every species has different rates of, um, of being able to adapt to its environment. Um, again, survival existence is also survival of the fittest. Is, they go hand in hand. Some individuals better suited for the environment and are more likely to survive and reproduce, as I've mentioned for the coral species. So natural selection is the unequal ability of individuals to survive and reproduce, leading to a gradual change in the population with favorable characteristics accumulating over generations of new species evolved. Um, so again, example with the giraffe, you will probably have, uh, say, a parent that has an off, has say, if they have five offsprings, for example, some will have short necks and some will have long necks. But then based on the resources that are present, if there are a lot more taller trees, so the ones with the longer necks are slowly going to evolve over time to adapt better to its environment. Uh, if there are no shorter trees, the short neck giraffes will, will die and so they will not be in existence. Pretty much like that. Or unless the short neck giraffes decides to migrate somewhere else and find a new habitat with resources you can feed on, then they can survive. So that's what it is. Um, so far, am I going too fast or is everybody okay with what I'm talking about? Okay, Doctor. Okay, good. Very good. Uh, at any point, if anybody's confused, I'm happy for you to stop me. Don't be afraid. Especially being our last class. Okay. So factors of natural selection, basically, organisms produce more offsprings that can survive. Of course, how they produce more is based on after they adapt, those characters can actually, again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a marriage between phenotype and genotype. Sometimes phenotype may not, a genotype may not be able to express things phenotypically, but it's in that gene based on their strength to survive. So that's how that can be passed on. Variations are found among individuals of a species. Uh, variations, sometimes can be very important key points to help uh, with survival, but sometimes it may not actually be of use. So example, variations can be sometimes, maybe uh, just by coincidence, one species had um, a unique mutation of colors. If, we didn't, if there were no other parents to, to pass on that, then probably we may have just died off with one organism. Or the fact that we have an extra so uh, we have an, if some of those who have extra toes, six toes, for example, that is just more of a mutation or a variation that doesn't quite help in the long run, unless you find another one who has six toes and then somehow you keep breeding on with people with six toes, eventually we might have a population of six toed people. I don't know, it can happen. So again, variations, depending on how you pass it on. Some variations allow members of a population to survive and reproduce better than others. Again, very good example is the giraffe example. 
So now variations are inherited trait, a change in your DNA makeup because of the insertion or deletion of the nucleotide in a, that one that I showed in the previous class. And that makes an individual different from other members of the same species. But please remember, this one happens over time. This kind of useful trait that is passed down uh, in a longer period of time, it, it has to be um, something that is useful that can be passed on over time. So it can be color, shape, behavior, or even chemical makeup. In order for you to understand this better, um, if you remember on my slides for speciation, I've given a few examples of videos um, in that slide. And, and there's one example about speciation with birds on an island. So maybe you can look that up for, for uh, a refresher, yeah? So what makes natural selection different from artificial selection? Natural selection results in changes inherited, uh, in inherited characteristics of a population. This is in the wild. These changes increase a species fitness within the environment. For artificial selection, nature provides the variations among different organisms, but humans select those variations they find useful. So just a quick question. Where do you find artificial selection most common in? In which industry? Uh, cat breeders. Say that again. Uh, cat breeders. Very good. Breeders for pets, yes. Apart from pets? Um, plants. Uh, okay, pets. Plants, okay. So, okay, then what else? This is more, okay, I hear more of hobbies, but how about others? Any ideas? The most important thing, your makan. Makan? Yes, agriculture and aquaculture. Oh. So you're choosing, uh, say, fishes with the best, um, what do you call it, best flesh uh, fish, or you're talking about, say, for plants, for seaweeds. You have certain, I don't know, certain proteins or whatever not that actually uh, is actually gives seaweeds a better taste in texture etc those are also natural selection because obviously then later if you want to culture them you're culturing based on those features so it is present in 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 nature but what we do is humans intervene to uh, to to play around with this so um to some extent we have gone uh, we have gone beyond artificial selection by including GMO, genetically modified organisms. So now, this is a debate where a lot of people talk about, oh my gosh, it's inducing chemical compounds and all and changing all animals and making them so unnatural, etc. Technically, technically, this one is a very debatable topic because sometimes a lot of... Um, Scientists and non-scientists think as if we are playing God. But again, this is up to you. This isn't more of an opinionated thing because it talks about human ethics also. GMO has been very much used. Uh, in fact, artificial selection is part of a drive for uh, genetically modified organisms. But some genetically modified organisms, what they do is, example, they might take uh, genetic material from a different organism and incorporate it to something. So example, like say, um, for tomatoes to be able to thrive better in colder conditions, they might actually use some uh, aspect of the gene from, say, um, ikan sebelah from a halibut, which will be incorporated into the tomato, uh, which will be able to uh, ensure tomatoes can last a little longer. So technically, it's still found in the natural environment, but GMO sometimes can, can incorporate things from other different organisms. All right? So again, this is the part where ethics can, can be controversial because to what extent do you really want to use it? Is this really going to benefit for medical purposes or is it really going to help in terms of 
for sustainability for food so this those kind of things all right but natural natural selection is those that happens in the wild we do not intervene at all so if it happens that it has to die it might die artificial selection can actually help with conservation purposes so if um certain species that have gone extinct and then we want to revive that species back can be done so they have for smaller organisms uh they, they have been there are species that have been revived i think certain toads have been revived etc and of course we know of dolly the, the sheep you know since dolly's time this is way back in what 2010 no not even 2010 to year 2000 so so this kind of artificial selection and trying to breed and clone and all it's all part and parcel of of this of this thing but it's a very controversial aspect lah but it's it's happening in terms of application um this point we are quite okay right please let me know if you can't hear me because it's raining here so i need to know at any point if you if i terputus okay good so now how does evolution come about There are three three things that we look when it comes to how evolution has come about, ah, uh, but the two main important ones it's ah uh, graduation and punctuated equilibrium. Another one is called cata catastrophism. Catastrophism ah uh, are usually incidences where where we believe um say a big asteroid hit hit the earth and actually. caused a mass extinction of um of animals and plants and whatever not and then from that how species evolve over time that is catastrophism but um uh, but those because those are very rare we don't talk about it as much so the ones that are focused on is this one gradualism and punctuated equilibrium so now for gradualization gradualism it's a slow and steady process where you can see different forms of new species with very minor changes happening so this one is actually very 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 rare in the evolution also even i mean catastrophism is more rare but then gradualism is also rare so this one is very much seen in this example for horses okay so horses uh, from at this point which which evolved about 50 million years ago 50 million years ago to what we know of now there isn't much difference other than the size okay so um and then in terms of the teeth etc even then also it's not very variant it's just more of a size difference that you can see and the interesting part is because it has happened in a long period like 50 million years ago um you can still see the gradual you can see the different species and there's no missing link but what makes punctuate punctuated equilibrium different is that it happens very quickly okay so like in this one is very if 50 million years this one can happen within a, a more shorter period of time in this case they managed to track back to 36 million but this is also considered this is also considered long if it happens very quickly it's within 5 million 10 million or so okay again time is the factor sometimes intermediate species are not there so because the evolution for punctuated equilibrium happens very fast sometimes you have missing links based on the different uh uh time frames okay so like say for the eocene period they managed to find how all the species had a common ancestor here but in this point they are unable to find a common ancestor for all of the species at this point because the change has happened so rapidly in comparison to this you notice that there's not much diversity in comparison to this there's not much branching it is just very much sorry it is just very much one way so that's what they mean by it's a very slow gradual gradual means very slow and steady and you can still see the species forming whereas this one you you will have missing links So that's why they said sometimes intermediate species are not there, and species branch off and evolve seamlessly. So in this case, this one has branched off, but then there's no other branching that has happened. 
So that is why this is considered as punctuated equilibrium. So which one is the most accepted? Actually, it's both. Gradu it's actually a marriage of both. Both gradulation and punctuated equilibrium sometimes can help understand species better. These are more um, elaborated studies done for horses and elephants, but there are so many more species out there that are actually um, that we are still unaware of. So something that if you're if you like to be an evolutionary scientist, you can probably venture into the to a specific species. So again, what makes gradulation and um, punctuated equilibrium different is that for gradulation states that evolution occurred very slowly over a longer period of time. And another point here is that uh, there's no, very rarely do you find missing links of intermediate species. Punctuated equilibrium is when there are periods of apparent stasis interrupted by sudden change. Okay, so in this case that you will have uh, a lot of rapid changes in these periods and then it suddenly comes to a stop here. So there's not been any changes happening again at some stage. All right, are we clear with this? Before the last parts, we are coming to evidence. evidence. You're good, eh? Okay, all right, good. So now, you may have heard in your past about, or oh, because of the fact religion can sometimes mix with science, and sometimes that is where all of this debate comes about creation versus evolution. I will leave that to opinion because I don't want to intervene based on your kind of religion and beliefs. But as a scientist, if you are supposed to defend, hey, evolution um, is real, it may, you may be a hypothesis upper, but what, again, every form of science is evidence-based. That is what you need to know. So what are the evidences of evolution? So the first one is, of course, you can look at fossil records. So it remains, it's, fossil records are the remains or imprints. So sometimes you can actually see remains sepertini. But sometimes you may not be able to retrieve the remain and you might just see an imprint. Maybe because this has dissolved. So, uh, so sometimes you will just see, uh, it's like when you make a footprint on the, on the beach. So your foot is not on the beach, but you have left an imprint in that strata. So that's what an imprint is. So it's the remains or imprints of past life preserved in sediments. And again, sediments are different based, um, uh, based on time, yeah? So, the, so again, it occurs in rocky layers. So every rocky layer is made of different materials. Okay, and these different materials form different strata. strata. So the strata, um, again, is different based on time also. Fossils in different layers of rocks, uh, mainly is sedimentary rock, showed evidence of gradual change over time. So now, I just want to ask you guys, um, in Form 3, Science, did you guys learn about the different ways rocks are formed? There are three different ways. Am I right? Betul. Betul lah, Dari, Ingat. Uh, daripada lapisan, eh, daripada petroleum tu. Uh, okay, okay. But how is it from the process? Ada tiga jenis processes, betul? Betul. Salah satunya pemendapan, kalau tak silap. Okay, so pemendapan comes from where? Uh, daripada uh, pressure... Uh, apa tekanan kerak bumi? Okay, kalau very good. Yes, very good. Um, kalau kalau sedimentary rock macam mana? Sedimentary rock eh? <laughs> Yang tu tak ingat. Tak ingat. Okay, but don't forget some. Some is from molten rock. Uh, so no, sorry, molten lava. When it's spouted out from the volcanoes, and then when it cools off later, and then whatever say organisms that are trapped within that. They can actually form layers and layers after that also. Pemanapan is another form. Volcanic eruption is another form. There's another one. I pun dah terlupa dah. It's very long time ago. So, try to form back. But these are how rocks are formed. So, because of the different processes, the kinds of materials and the timing is also going to be different. 
But very good. Uh, Wani yang jawab tadi kan? Ingat sikit-sikit je. Tak apa. Bagus, bagus. So again, <laughs> benda semua tu jangan lupa sebab kita boleh aplikasikan lagi. Alright. The next one is, oh, okay sorry, still fossil record. So the order of fossil appearance shows more complex forms appearing after simple forms. Okay. And recent fossils, new strata, uh, most closely resemble modern organisms. Okay. So what they're trying to say here is, most recent fossils, if you want to show, okay, so about fossils semuanya lama-lama, so you will, you'll be wondering, technically, kalau fossils are all ancestral, which one will be considered more older? So obviously, you have to look at the carbon dating and what sort of strata. So if this lower strata, if you found organisms here in this lower strata, it is obviously lagi lama compared to fossils of this strata, which is more common. So that is how they look at fossil records. Okay, and they can show complex appearance. So this is what they found very interesting. Okay, so oh, this is the Archaeopteryx. It's a form of uh, dinosaur-like bird. Okay, um, based on a fossil record. What they found very interesting during this time when, when people found this fossil is that Although he had very reptile structures, what they found interesting here is that they could see um, imprints of feathers. So that was what made it very unique at one point where that reptiles and birds can actually be related. So you don't see this kind of um, existence in current species, at least some of the ones that we can see unless you see rare ones. But because, that's why fossil records can still hold very important information based on these very small details, even for organ structures, etc. So those are actually very important. And also the where it's found, the strata also resembles time. So that is how they can do, and carbon dating. So that's how they can sort of almost plot, okay, at this time they found this species and how it evolves. Piecing up the puzzle. Basically, when you're doing evolutionary Trees like this is also about piecing up puzzles together. And you'll always, the more you find evidence, the more it helps paint a better picture. Okay, the other form of evidence of evolution, again, is taxonomy. Taxonomy will always be the foundation of any of form of science. How you apply later for other understanding of science is different. So in this case, for taxonomy, for evolution, it's hierarchical classification structures developed by linears. And it implies that species can be grouped together based on their relatedness. When you talk about relatedness, what are you talking about? Of course, you're talking about the characters, the morphological or uh, molecular characteristics. Again, not forgetting, you can also look into behavior. You can also look in. Um, you can also look into uh, apony, uh, embryology. A lot of things you can look into. So bears with bears, bees with bees, all about grouping. A family tree can be made implying descent. So if you, so the family tree, so not really family tree, but more of the, the hierarchy that you're forming is based mainly on descendants, but it's not going to necessarily show relationship on who's, uh, in terms of ancestor, okay? Now the third point is comparative anatomy. So it, what evidence looks at is it compares anatomical structures from different organisms. So again, for taxonomy, uh, it applies more on identification of yourself based on that character that you have. What evolution, phylogeny all looks into is that from that character, we want to see how related something is and how different something is. So if more common characteristics that are similar, then you can apply that to phonetics that you learned in the previous class. But this one also, we are also looking at shared characters in order to help with evolution. Similar structures in two or more species are called homologous structures. Okay, shared derived characters. Okay, so shared derived characters are what is most important. So like contohnya, ingat tak yang clay yang ada tunjuk leopard dengan yang cat? So you want to know the shared character, like say um, the retractable claws, 
that is a, a homologous character for both of for both of the species. But if the one which is just for purring of the cat, it is not helpful because you can't see any. That is a very species specific character. It's not helpful for understanding relationships. Okay, and then scientists notice that animals um, with back bones, okay, which are vertebrates, had similar bone structure. So you, as is mentioned. So, flying, and just by chance, birds, bats, and pterodactyl, they are actually vertebrae. So this one can be grouped together in a in a bigger aspect. But then, when you look into a smaller aspect, like um, when you're talking about monophyly and polyphyly, etc., you won't see very common ancestors ancestors because birds, are, okay, maybe say birds and bats, they are warm blooded, but pterodactyl. Usually being a reptile, it's actually cold-blooded. So this one makes it a different group altogether. So birds and bats, they have beaks, they have claws. So it's quite different from bats. Alright, but as vertebrates, yes, they are the same. Scientists noticed, uh, okay, had similar bone structures, but it may differ in function. So when I mention about birds, bees and bats, although they have wings, which is to function to fly, it may not necessarily come from the same ancestor. But in this case, the balipula, you see vertebrae, the bone structure of the limbs is very different. But how we have used it is become different. So for us humans and I think they meant for apes, lah, eh? for insectivores, oh, sorry, for insectivores, those who like to eat insects or fruits, we have used our limbs for grasping holding things the limbs the forefront limbs for dogs and sheep they have used that for running the forefront limbs for dolphins and seals their function is for swimming um, and for this it's for flying but we all share a common ancestor based on the bone structure the vertebrae part which is a primitive shared structure structure all right so that is how you have to look into how common and how less common the ancestors are or in, in their character. Vestigial structures. So this one, uh, if you remember the, in the beginning of the slide, I showed an example of an evolutionary tree of the hippopotamus and whales being related with hippopotamus being the, com the most common ancestor. So one of the things they looked into is vestigial structures. So vestigial structures is a body part that doesn't seem to have a function at the, this time. This time meaning for current descendants. But probably for the ancestors, it was present which was important at that time. But later because of environmental changes, there's less use of that. So we don't see that anymore. Okay, for just for a quick quiz or quick uh, question. What vestigial structures do we have that are not in use anymore in comparison to some of our related species? Contohnya macam monkeys and apes. For, for the sake of evolution, yeah? how are we doing? Uh, hmm. Appendix. Very good. Other examples? If you look at the bone structure of our backbone, what's, what's different? Um, tulang yang dekat, tulang bontuk tu yang hujung sekali tu apa? Apa, um, tu? apa nama dia? Start dengan A kan? Start dengan C? Eh, eh C ya. Um, Toxic tu. Yes, correct. Siapa kata? Uh, correct. Toxic, correct. Apa lagi? Okay, if you notice your mata, mata um, you have something Pink at the center, can the inner corner of your eyes. Okay, for other animals, they can actually, kalau katakan macam crocodiles, etc., they can use that layer to cover the whole eye. Before they, they so they have different layers to actually cover. We, we just have one, apa, uh, klopak mata ni, to just close our eyes. But for other animals, they actually, some other animals, they still have that structure. That can actually close and op uh, jump close to form a protective layer based on their environment. 
So that's one. Uh, apa lagi? I pun dah terlupa. We actually have some more. We have actually quite a, a number of other vestigial structures. Tapi I, I forgot. Tapi good job for those who answered. I rasa telinga pun ada ada fungsi sebenarnya. But I forgot which some some part of the ear lobe actually. Anyhow, the next point. Evidence in evolution. Ah, this one is interesting. So, for comparative and biology, embryos, which is the young state of the organisms, are also usually compared. So sometimes you look at the example, say with uh, barnacles, barnacles, and you say crustaceans. You crustaceans, like crabs, etc. If you look at the crab and the barnacle, no way will you think that these two are actually crustaceans. Okay, but this is where embryology uh, or larval stage uh, studies are actually very important because the larval stage itself will actually show that hey, at the nuclei stage, memang it's actually very similar or the larval stage because of the, the structures of, of the appendages. So that is why embryology is also very important. So embryonic structures of different species show significant similarities. So the fact that we are so different from birds. But look at how the formation of a bird is, the backbone here. Look at the formation of the amphibian, which has a backbone, and mammals. We, we pretty much just look the same like that at this stage. Okay? So similar features are due to shared ancestry. So this is what, and then the fact that we have amniotics, uh, no, sorry, we don't have an amniotic sac. Some have a yolk sac. Some, uh, we are formed in the amniotic sac of a, uh, it's actually quite, very interesting and quite similar. Biogeography was also very important in understanding evolution. So it looks into the distribution of species, and many related species occurs. Many related species occurs across the earth, but some can be very isolated. So a very perfect example for this is Australia, where they have the unique species of monotremes. Okay, monotremes are once uh, they are not even mammals, but it's just that they are warm-blooded, but some of them are able to lay eggs. Okay? So, but many species that occur across the earth, uh, this can be explained by geographic explanation by a continental drift. So, for example, if you see at one point when all this was the Great Pangaea, where all the continents were combined together, see for South America plate and African plate, they, are, they, were, they managed to find fossil records, especially of dinosaurs, uh, which had similar species on both of these continents. So fossil records are also very important to show that at one point, this stage, and you can correlate with the time of where the drifting occurred, that species are actually very much related. So the thing with volcanic eruptions is, yeah, they will, these are things that actually help create more land, more sediment, and it will split over time. But some will termend up depending on how um, dense one oceanic crust is uh, and another one is less dense or compact. So then you have cases like compression scarcity like with the Himalayas. So it's like for Mount Everest, etc., it's continuously being pushed over time. So it's getting higher. But some are split and drawn apart. Okay? And then you also have molecular biology, where it includes comparisons of protein sequences, DNA, and chloroplast genosomes. So this part is the one that is more famous and is more commonly used now. But again, don't, not say don't rely on molecular biology, but don't solely rely on molecular biology because, again, you still need morphological uh, morphology to help uh, sort of explain how evolution has worked over time. And in, in fact, not just that, all this, uh, geography, in terms of embryology, the more evidence you have, it paints a better picture of your evolution. Okay, the last slide for today and for the whole semester, this whole course, are the misconception of about evolution. So they mentioned, you might hear people saying, evolution is just a theory or best guess. So it's not supported by scientific evidence. So as you would have already known, what I've already covered for you, there are six, in fact, there are more evidences, uh, sorry, to show that evolution is science and science is evidence-based. 
but it is not to be accepted as a fact it is a hypothesis okay so hypothesis can change the more you have new evidence so don't get this thing wrong okay number two organisms change and evolve because they have a desire to do so so basically two is trying to explain about creation is uh, creationism where evidence um it just happens as it is no as you already know now environmental uh, pressures help uh, what do you call this um, derive the, uh, the organisms to search for food for shelter for mating and to help carry their offspring so those are the, the the changes that drives evolution number three we can't see evolution happening in a way true we can't directly see in our eyes but we have evidence to show so that evolution can occur you have molecular evidence you have uh, embryology study, uh, studies you have um, you have fossil records these are all as much as it's present at the time but it's definitely happening slowly and gradually number four evolution leads to more advanced organisms that are climbing the evolutionary ladder okay this is the part that you have to understand that it doesn't mean that we although evolve from monkeys it doesn't make them it doesn't make us more advanced ha huh? yes we may have evolved and then that means monkeys may have uh, been present longer but it doesn't make us more advanced so the term is not to use advanced we are we this the word derived or we have evolved making advance as if um uh, as if macam kita nak alala kata we ni we are not so primitive ada yang lagi kuno nah it doesn't work that way evolution shows yes things evolve over time but some of those so called primitive species are also present in current ones so contohnya macam case hippopotamus dengan whales when it shows that whales uh, sorry that that hippopotamus shows that they have a, uh, that one of the ancestors for current whales but if you notice that it still managed to evolve to it being a descendant it did not die off so that's why there's no such thing as advance or non advance okay the last one evolution occurs in individual organisms again this is relating back to creationism where it shows that species are unique as it is and it formed as it is no evolution the theory of evolution talks about that species are uh, evolve over time and those characters are inheritable and it's derived from um changes of your environment all right so pretty much that's it for my class um if you please look at elearn on for this topic i've also included a a case study of how the whales have evolved from hippopotamus that is one of the exam questions that will come up for your exam most likely i pun at lupa but please read that up and um please make sure you understand that because there may be either a structure or essay question so please make sure you faham kan the concept so that's all for my class today um if you have thank you very much so